Hello, good evening. Welcome. So tonight we are going to be getting back into The Women Who Run With the Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman Archetype by Clarissa Pinkola Estes, PhD. So chapter six, chapter six is titled Finding One's Pack, Belonging as Blessing. The Ugly Duckling. Sometimes life goes wrong for the wildish woman from the beginning. Many women had parents who surveyed them as children and puzzled over how this small alien had managed to infiltrate the family. Other parents were always looking heavenward, ignoring or abusing the child or giving her the old icicle eye. Let women who have had this experience take heart. You have avenged yourself by having been, through no fault of your own, a handful to raise and an eternal thorn in their sides. And perhaps even today, you are able to inspire them to abject fear when you come a noggin. That's not too shabby as innocent retribution goes. See to it now that you spend less time on what they didn't give you and more time on finding the people you belong to. You may not belong to your original family at all. You may match your family genetically, but temperamentally, you may belong to another group of people, or you may belong to your family perfunctor perfunctorily while your soul leaps out, runs down the road, and is gluttonously happy munching spiritual cookies somewhere else. <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen wrote dozens of literary stories about children who were orphans. He was a premier advocate of the lost and neglected child, and he sought support he strongly supported searching for and finding one's own kind. His rendering of The Ugly Duckling was first published in 1845. The ancient motif underlying the tale is about the unusual and the dis dispossessed, a perfect wild woman demi-history. For the last two centuries, The Ugly Duckling has been one of the few stories to encourage successive generations of outsiders to hold on till they find their own. It is what I would call a psychological and spiritual root story. A root story is one that contains a truth so fundamental to human development that without integration of this fact, further progression is shaky, and one cannot entirely prosper psychologically until this point is realized. So here is The Ugly Duckling that I wrote as a literary story based on the eccentric version originally told in the Magyar language by the... Fallusions, Meseloc, rustic tellers from my family. Ooh. <laughs> hey, welcome. Welcome, Cool Gamer at Desert Rose. Awesome. So, yeah, I'll get a sip of this and then um, I'll get into the ugly duckling. Mmm. The Ugly Duckling. It was near the time of the harvest. The old women were making green dolls from the corn sheaths or sheaves. The old men were mending the blankets. The girls were embroidering their white dresses with blood red flowers. The boys were singing as they pitched golden hay. The women were knitting scratchy shir uh, shirts for the coming winter. The men were helping to pick and pull and cut and hoe the fruits and fields had brought forth. Cut and hoe the fruits the fields had brought forth. The wind was just beginning to loosen the leaves a little more, and then a little more each day. And down by the river, there was a mother duck brooding on her nest of eggs. Everything was going as it should for this mother duck, and finally, one by one, her eggs began to tremble and shake until the shells cracked and out staggered all her new ducklings. But there was one egg left, a very big egg. It just sat there like a stone. An old duck came by, and the duck mother showed off her new children. Aren't they good looking, she bragged. But the unhatched egg caught the old duck's attention, and she tried to dissuade the duck mother from sitting on that egg any longer. It's a turkey egg, exclaimed the old duck. Not a proper kind of egg at all. Can't get a turkey into the water, you know. 
She knew, for she had tried. But the duck mother felt that she had been sitting for such a long time, a little longer would not hurt. I'm not worried about that, she said. But do you know that scoundrel father of these ducklings hasn't come to visit me once? <laughs> but eventually, the big egg began to shudder and roll. It finally broke open, and out tumbled a big, ungainly creature. His skin was etched with curly red and blue veins. His feet were pale purple, his eyes transparent pink. The duck mother cocked her head and stretched her neck and peered at him. She couldn't help herself. She pronounced him ugly. Maybe it's all a turkey. Maybe it's a turkey after all, she worried. But when the ugly duckling took to the water with the other offspring, the duck mother saw that he swam straight and true. Yes, he's one of my own, even though he's very peculiar in appearance. But actually, in the right light, he's almost handsome. So she presented him to the other creatures in the farmyard, but before she knew it, another duck shot across the courtyard and bit the ugly ducking, duckling right in the neck. The duck mother cried, stop! But the bully sputtered, well, he looks so strange and ugly, he needs to be pushed around. And the queen duck, with the red rag on her leg, said, oh, he's going to be very strong. He just laid in the egg too long and is yet a little misshapen. He'll straighten out, though. You'll see. She groomed the ugly duckling's feathers and licked his cowlicks. But the others did all they could to harass the ugly duckling. They flew at him, bit him, pecked him, hissed and screeched at him. And their torment of him grew worse as time went on. He hid. He dodged. He zigzagged left and right. But he could not escape. The duckling was as miserable as any creature could be. At first, his mother defended him, but then even she grew tired of it all and exclaimed in expression and exasperation, I wish you would just go away. I wish you would just go away. And so the ugly duckling ran away with most of his feathers pulled out and looking extremely bedraggled. He ran and ran until he reached a marsh. There he lay down at the water's edge with his neck stretched out and sipped as he could as he could from the water now and then from the rushes two ganders watched him they were young and full of themselves say there you ugly thing they sniggered want to come over want to come with us over to the next county there's a gaggle of young unmarried geese over there just ripe for the take for the choosing suddenly shots rang out and the ganders fell with a thud and the marsh water ran red with their blood. The ugly duckling dived for cover, and all around were shots and smoke and dogs barking. At last, the marsh became quiet, and the duckling ran and flew as far away as he could. Toward nightfall, he came to a poor hovel. The door was hanging by a thread. There were more cracks than walls. He li the here lived an old raggedy woman with her uncombed cat and her cross-eyed hen. The cat earned her keep with the old woman by catching mice. The hen earned her keep by laying eggs. The old woman felt lucky to have found a duck. Maybe it will lay eggs, she thought, and if not, we can kill it and eat it. So the duck stayed, but he was tormented by the cat and hen, who asked him, what good are you if you cannot lay and you cannot catch? What I, what I love best, sighed the duckling, is to be under whether it is under the wide blue sky or under the cool blue water. The cat could make no sense of being underwater and criticize the duckling for his stupid dreams. The hen could make no sense of getting her feathers all wet, and she made fun of the duckling too. In the end, it was clear there would be no peace for the duckling there. So he left to see if things would be better down the road. He came upon a pond, and as he swam there, it became colder and colder. A flock of creatures flew overhead, the most beautiful he had ever seen. They, they cried down on him, and hearing their sounds made his heart leap and break at the same time. He cried back in a sound he had never before made. He had never seen creatures more beautiful than they, and he had never felt more bereft. Yay! Welcome in, Angelfish!
He turned and turned in the water to watch them till they flew out of sight. Then he dove to the bottom of the lake and huddled there, trembling. He was beside himself, for he felt a desperate love for these great white birds, a love he could not understand. A colder wind began to blow harder and harder through the days, and snow came upon frost. The old men broke the ice in the the old men broke the ice in the milk pails, and the old women spun long into the night. The mothers fed three mouths at once by candlelight, and the men searched for the sheep under white skies at midnight. The young men, men went waist-deep in the snow to go to milking, and the girls imagined they saw the faces of handsome young men in the flames of the fire while they cooked. And down at the pond nearby, the duckling had to swim faster and faster in circles to keep a pace for himself in the ice. One morning, duck, the duckling found himself frozen in the ice, and it was then that he felt he would die. Two mallards flew down and skidded into the ice. They surveyed the duck. You are ugly, they barked. Too bad, so sad. Nothing can be done for such, a, for such as you. And off they flew. Luckily, a farmer came by and freed the duckling by breaking the ice with his staff. He lifted the duckling up and tucked him under his coat and marched home. In the farmer's house, the children reached for the duckling, but he was afraid. He flew up to the rafters, making all the dust fall down onto the butter. From there, he dove right into the milk pitcher, and as he struggled out all wet and woozy, he fell over into the flour barrel. The farmer's wife chased him with her broom, and the children screamed with laughter. The duckling flapped through the cat's door, and outside at last, lay in the snow half dead. From there he struggled on till he came to another pond, and an then another house, another pond, another house, and the entire winter was spent this way, alternating between life and death. And even so, the gentle breath of spring came again, and the old women shook out the feather beds, and the old men put away their long underwear. New babies came in the night, while fathers paced the yard under starry skies. During daylight, the young girls put daffodils in their hair, and young men studied girls' ankles. And on a pond nearby, the water became warmer, and the ugly duckling who floated there stretched his wings. How long and big his wings were! They lifted him high over the land. From the air he saw the orchards in their white gowns, the farmers plowing, the young of all nature hatching, tumbling, buzzing, and swimming. Also paddling on the pond were three swans, the same beautiful creatures he had seen the autumn before, those that so caused his heart to ache. He felt pulled to join them. What if they act as though they like me? And then, just as I join them, they fly away laughing, thought the duckling. But he glided down and landed on the pond, his heart beating hard. As soon as they saw him, the swans began to swim, swim towards him. No doubt I'm about to meet my end, thought the duckling. But if I am to be killed, then rather by these beautiful creatures than by hunters, farm, farm wives, or long winters, and he bowed his head to await the blows. But la, in the reflection in the water, he saw a swan in full dress, snowy plumage, slow eyes and all. The ugly duckling did not at first recognize himself, for he looked just like the beautiful strangers, just like those he had admired from afar. And it turned out that he was one of them after all, his egg had accidentally rolled into a family of ducks. He was a swan, a glorious swan, and for the first time, his own kind came near him and touched him gently and lovingly with their wingtips. They groomed him with their beaks and swam round and round him in greeting. And the children who came to feed the swans bits of bread cried out, There's a new one! And as children everywhere do, they ran to tell everyone, and the old women came down to the water, unbraiding their long silver hair, and the young men cupped the deep green water with their hands and flicked it at the younger girls, who blushed like petals. 
The men took time away from milking just to breathe the air. The women took time away from the mending just to laugh with their mates. And the old men told stories about how war is too long and life too short. And one by one, because of life and passion and time passing, they all danced away. The young men, the young women, all danced away. And the old ones, the husbands, the wives, they all danced away. The children and the swans all danced away, leaving just us and the springtime and down by the river. Another mother duck begins to brood on her nest of eggs. I like it. All right, let's get into the interpretation. The problem of the exiled one is, per, uh, how do you how do you pronounce it? Primeval, primeval. The problem of the exiled one is primeval. Many fairy tales and myths center around the theme of the outcast. In such tales, the central figure is tortured by events outside her venue, often due to a poignant oversight. In *The Sleeping Beauty*. The thirteenth fairy is overlooked and not invited to the christening, which results in a curse being placed upon the child, effectively exiling everyone in one way or another. Sometimes exile is enforced through sheer meanness, as when the stepmother casts her stepdaughter out into the dark wood in Vasilisa the Wise. Other times, exile comes about as the result of a naive error. The Greek god Hephaestus took his mother's Hera's side in an argument with Zeus. Her husband, Zeus, became infuriated and hurled Hephaestus off Mount Olympus, banishing and crippling him. Sometimes exile comes from striking a bargain one does not understand, such as in the tale of a man who agrees to wander as a beast for a certain number of years in order to win some gold, and later discovers he's given his soul to the devil in disguise. The ugly duckling theme is universal. All stories of the exile contain the same nucleus of meaning, but each is surrounded by different frills and furbellows, reflecting the cultural background of the story, as well as the poetry of the individual teller. The core meaning we are concerned with are these. The duckling of the story is symbolic of the wild nature, which, when pressed into circumstances of little nurture, instinctively strives to continue no matter what. The wild nature instinctively holds on and holds out, sometimes with style, other times with little grace, but holds on nevertheless. And thank goodness for that. For the wildish woman, duration is one of her greatest strengths. The other important aspect of the story is that when an individual's particular kind of soulfulness, which is both an instinctual and a spiritual identity, is surrounded by psychic acknowledgement and acceptance. That person feels life and power as never before. So there's a word up here I really want to look up, even though I, I'm enjoying the read. For something. Where is it? Excuse me. Fur bellows. F-U-R-B-E-L-O-W-S. I don't know what it means. Let's find out. Furbelows. And I'm done with this page. Furbelows? <laughs> hey, Michelle, welcome in. I'm looking up a word now. Desiderata. Des is, that how I, is that how you say it? I'm trying to remember that word I looked up earlier. Furbelows. Yeah, it's like fur furbelows. For below definition. Below. For below. For below. A gathered strip or pleated border of a skirt or petticoat. Oh, cool. For below. <laughs> Trains 
of daughters, furbelowed and flounced by the same dressmakers. Furbelowed. Cool. I like it. Furbelows. <laughs> Furbelow. <laughs> it's not five below, but it's fur below. <laughs> So I finished this page. So that person feels life and power as never before. Ascertaining one's own psychic family brings a person vitality and belongingness. Exile of the unmatched child. In the story, the various creatures of the village peer at the ugly duckling and one way or another pronounce him unacceptable. He is not ugly in reality, but he does not match the others. He is so different that he looks like a black bean in a bushel of green peas. The mother duck at first tries to defend this duckling, whom she believes to be her offspring, but finally she is profoundly divided emotionally and withdraws from caring for the alien child. His siblings and others of his community fly at him, peck at him, torment him. They mean to chase him away, and the ugly duckling is heartbroken, really, to be rejected by his own. It is a terrible thing, especially since he really did nothing to warrant it, other than look different and act a little different. If truth be told, we have here, before this creature is even half grown, a duckling with a massive psychological complex. Girl children who display a strong instinctive nature often experience significant suffering in early life. From the time they are babies, they are taken they are taken captain, they are taken captive, domesticated, told they are wrongheaded and improper. Their wildish natures show up early. They are curious, artful, and have gentle eccentricities of various sorts. Ones that, if developed, will constitute the basis for their creativity for the rest of their lives. Considering that the creative life is the soul's food and water, this basic development is excruciatingly critical. Generally, early exile begins through no fault of one's own and the exacerbated and is exacerbated by the misunderstanding, the cruelty of ignorance, or through the intentional meanness of others. Then, the basic self of the psyche is wounded early on. When this happens, a girl begins to believe that the negative images her family and culture reflect back to her about herself are not only totally true, but are also totally free of bias, but are also totally free of bias, opinion, and personal preference. The girl begins to believe that she is weak, ugly, unacceptable, and that this will continue to be true no matter how hard she tries to reverse it. A girl is banished for the exact reasons we see in The Ugly Duckling. In many cultures, there is an expectation when the female child is born that she is or will become a certain type of person, acting in a certain time-honored way, that she will have a certain set of values, which if not identical to the family's, then at least based on the family's values, and which at any rate will not rock the boat. These expectations are defined very narrowly when one or both parents suffer from a desire for the angel child, that is, the perfect conforming child. In some parents' fantasy, whatever child they have will be perfect and will reflect only the parents' way and ways and means. If the child is wildish, she may, unfortunately, be subjected to her parents' attempt at psychic surgery over and over again, for they are trying to remake the child, and more so trying to change what her soul requires of her. Though her soul requires seeing, the cultural culture around her requires sightlessness. Boom, dude. What a sentence. Though her soul wishes to speak its truth, she is pressured to be silent. Neither the child's soul nor her psyche can accommodate this. Pressure to be adequate in whatever manner authority defines, defines it can chase the child away, 
or underground, or set her to wander for a long time looking for a place of nourishment and peace. Hmm. When, cult when culture narrowly defines what constitutes success or desirable perfection in anything, looks, height, strength, form, uh, acquisitive power, economics, manliness, womanliness, good children, good behavior, religious belief, then corresponding mandates to measure oneself against these criteria are introjected into the psyches of all the members of that culture. So the issues of the exiled wildish woman are usually twofold, inner and personal, and outer and cultural. Hmm. Let us attend here to the inner issues of the exile. For when one develops adequate strength, not perfect strength, but moderate and serviceable strength, in being oneself and finding what one belongs to, one can then influence the outer community and cultural consciousness in masterful ways. What is moderate strength? It is when the internal mother who mothers you isn't 100% confident about what you do next. 75% confident will do nicely. 75% is a goodly amount. Remember, we say that a flower is blooming whether it is in half, three quarters, or full bloom. <laughs> That's awesome! <laughs> Genevieve, welcome in! <laughs> Kinds of mothers. While we can interpret the mother in the story as symbolic of one's external mother, most who are grown up now have as a legacy from their actual mother an internal mother. This is an aspect of psyche that acts and responds in a manner identical to a woman's experience in childhood with her own mother. Hmm. Further, this internal mother is made from not only the experience of the personal mother, but also other mothering figures in our lives, as well as the images held out as the good mother and the bad mother in the culture at the time of our childhoods. For most adults, if there was trouble with the mother once, but there is no more, there is still a duplicate mother in the psyche who sounds, acts, responds the same as in early childhood, even though a woman's culture may have evolved into more conscious reasoning about the role of mothers. The internal mother will have the same values and ideas about a, what about what a mother should look like, act like, as those in one's childhood culture. In-depth psychology this entire maze is called the mother complex. It is one of the core aspects of a woman's psyche, and it is important to recognize its condition, strengthening certain aspects, a writing some, dismantling others, and beginning over again if necessary. The duck mother in the story has several qualities, which we'll analyze one by one. She is representative of all at the same time, an ambivalent mother, a collapsed mother, and an unmothered mother. By examining these mothering structures, we can, be, we can begin to access whether our own internal mother complex staunchly sustains our unique qualities, or whether it needs a long overdue adjustment. Interesting. All right, let's learn about some mother archetypes or structures. Mm. Dude, this tea is so good. When, when I get to reading this, sometimes it makes my mouth so dry. The ambivalent mother. In our story, the duck mother is cut away, forced away from her instincts. She is 
taunted for having a child who is different. She is divided emotionally and as a result collapses and withdraws her caring from the alien child. Although initially she tries to stand firm, the duckling's otherness begins to jeopardize the mother's safety in her own community, and she tucks her head and dives. Have you not witnessed a mother forced to such a decision, if not fully, then partially? The mother bends to the desires of her village rather than aligning herself with her child. Right into the present, mothers still act, still act out the well-founded fears of centuries of women before them. To be shut out of a community is to be ignored and regarded with suspicion at the least, and to be hunted down and destroyed at the worst. A woman in such environs will often try to mold her daughter so that she acts properly in the, excuse me, outer world, thereby hoping to save her daughter and herself from attack. This is a mother and a child who are they who are then both divided in the ugly duckling the duck mother is psychically divided and this causes her to be pulled in several different directions which is what ambivalence is all about any mother who has ever been under fire will recognize her one pull is her own desire to be accepted by her village. Another is for her self-preservation. The third pull is to respond to the fear that she and her child will be punished, persecuted, or killed by the village. This fear is a normal response to an abnormal threat of psychic or physical violence. The fourth pull is the mother's instinctual love for her child and the, preser and the preservation of that child. It is not uncommon in in punitive cultures for women to be torn between being accepted by the ruling class, her village, and loving her child, be it a symbolic child, creative child, or biological child. This is an old, old story. Women have died psychically and spiritually for trying to protect the unsanctioned child, whether it be their art, their lover, their politics, their offspring, or their soul life. At the extreme, women have been hanged, burned, and murdered for denying the village prescriptions and sheltering the unsanctioned child. A mother with a child who is different must have the endurance of Sisyphus, the fearsomeness of the Cyclops, and the tough hide of Caliban to go against the mean-spirited culture, to go against a mean-spirited culture. The, mo the most destructive cultural conditions for a woman to be born into and to live under are those that insist on obedience without consultation with one soul, who, who's with no loving forgiveness rituals, who's, uh, oh, those with no loving forgiveness rituals, those that force a woman to choose between soul and society, those where compassion for others is walled off by economic tears or caste systems, where the body is seen as something needing to be cleaned, or as a shrine to be regulated by fiat, where the new, the unusual, or the different engenders no delight, and where curiosity and creativity are punished and denigrated instead of rewarded, or rewarded only if one is not a woman, where painful acts are per per perpetrated on the body and called holy, or whenever a woman is punished un unjustly, as Alice Miller puts it sus succinctly, ah, I'll have to look it up here, but I'll, we'll say what, hear what she says first. For her own good, where the soul is not recognized as being in its own right. S-U-C-C-I-N-C-T-L-Y. So we looking it up and I see where I am. The very first paragraph. S U C C. I think where'd you go? Yeah, C C I N C T. C T. <laughs> 
เอลไวเอลไวเดบิวชั่นโอเค in a brief and clearly expressed manner how do we say this word that is common succinctly 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 ไล succinctly ไล succinctly in a brief and clearly expressed manner succinctly so as Alice Miller puts it succinctly for her own good where the soul is not recognized as a being in its own right when a woman has a, this ambiv ambivalent mother construct in her own psyche she may find herself giving in too easily she may find herself afraid to take a stand to demand respect to assert her right to do it learn it live it in her own way whether these issues derive from an internal construct or an external culture in order for the mothering function to withstand such constraints she must have some very fierce qualities qualities that in many cultures are considered masculine for generations sadly the mother who wanted to engender esteem in herself and her offspring needed the very qualities that were expressly forbidden to her vehemence fearlessness and fearsomeness For a mother to happily raise a child who is slightly or largely different in psyche and soul needs from that of the mainstream culture. Oh wait, different, different from different soul needs. Soul needs. It's like one thing. <laughs> Got it. Psyche and soul needs from that of the mainstream culture. She must have a start on some heroic qualities herself. She must be able, like the heroines of myths, to find and obtain. These qualities, if they are not allowed to shelter them, unleash them at the right time, and stand for herself in what she believes, there is almost no way to make oneself ready for this, other than to take a deep draft of courage and then act, since time out of mind, a considered act of heroism, has been the cure for stultifying ambival ambivalence. Hmm. The collapsed mother. Let's try water this time. The collapsed mother. Finally, the duck mother can no longer stand the harassment of the child she has helped into the world. But what is even more telling is that she can no longer tolerate the torment she herself experiences from her community as she attempts to protect her alien child. So she collapses. She cries to the little duckling, "I wish you would, I wish you were far away," and the tortured duckling runs away. When a mother collapses psychologically, it means she has lost her sense of herself. She may be a malignantly narcissistic mother who feels entitled to be a child herself. More likely, she has been severed from the wildish self. And has been frightened into the collapse by some real threat, psychic or physical. When people collapse, they usually slide into one of three feeling states: a muddle, they're confused; a wallow, they feel no one adequately sympathizes with their travail; or a pit, an emotional replay of an old wounding, often an uncorrected and unaccounted for injustice done to them when they themselves were children. The way to cause a mother to collapse is to divide her emotionally. The more, the most common way, time out of mind, has been to force her to choose between loving her child and fearing what harm the village will visit on her and the child if she does not comply with the rules. In Sophie's Choice by William Styron, the heroine Sophie is a prisoner in a Nazi extermination extermination camp. She stands before the Nazi commandment. Co uh, commandant, with her two children in her arms, the commandant forces her to choose which of the two children will live and which will die by telling Sophie that if she refuses to make a choice, both children will be killed. While to be forced to make such a choice is unthinkable, 
It is a psychic choice that mothers have been forced to make for eons. Obey the rules and kill off your children or else. It goes on. When a mother is forced to choose between the child and the culture, there is something abhorrently cruel and unconsidered about that culture. A culture that requires harm to one's soul in order to follow a culture's prescriptions is a very sick culture indeed. This culture can be the one a woman lives in, but more damning yet, it can be the one she carries around and compiles with within her own mind. There are countless literal examples of this throughout the world. Some of the most heinous examples being found in America, where it has been traditional to force women away from their loved ones and from the things they love. There was the long and ugly history of breaking families forced into slavery in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. There is in the last many centuries the prescription that mothers should surrender their sons to the nation for the sake of war and be glad of it. There are the forced reparations. Uh, uh, the forced rep rep hmm. repatriations, repatriations, repatriations that continue yet today. Patriations, repatriations. Well, I'm looking it up. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Repatriations. Yeah. Repatriations. I wonder if I'm saying it right. Repatriations. Repatriation. The return of someone to their own country. Oh, yeah. Okay. Repatriation. Woo! Awesome! Cool. So yeah, the return of someone to their own country, the sending of money back to one's own country, the repatriation of profits by foreign investors, the voluntary repatriation of refugees. Cool. Boop. Repatriation. Son of a gun, I don't remember. Oh, here it is. There are the forced repatriations that continue yet today. There have been various fashions at various times throughout the world that prescribe that a woman should not be allowed to love and shelter whomever she loves and in whichever way she wishes. One of the least spoken about oppressions of women's soul lives concern, oh, lives, she it. <laughs> One of the least spoken about oppressions of Women's soul. Is it, what did I say? Soul lives concerns millions of unmarried mothers or never married mothers throughout the world, including the United States, who in this century alone were pressured by cultural mores to hide their children to hide their condition or their children or else to kill or surrender their offspring or to live a half-life under assumed identities and as reviled and disempowered citizens damn being what i know i know right? i don't understand Okay, so I'm going to reread that whole that whole paragraph since I struggled so hard through it. Hopefully I can make it better, make it through better this time, even though it's Okay. One of the least spoken about oppressions of women's soul, soul lives, mother of pearls, <laughs> concerns millions of unmarried mothers or never married mothers throughout the world, including the United States who in this century alone, were pressured by cultural mores to hide their condition or their children, or else to kill or surrender their offspring, or to live a half-life under assumed identities and as reviled for disempowered 
and disempowered citizens. For generations, women accepted the role of legitimizing humans through marriage to a man. They agreed that a human was not acceptable unless a man said so. Dude, I feel like my blood's boiling right now. It's okay. Right, perspectives, man. Ladies. Oh. Right, I mean... It's, I, I haven't... Yeah, let's see here. For generations, women accepted the role of legitimizing humans through marriage to a man. They agreed that a human was not acceptable unless a man said so. Without that masculine protection, the mother was vulnerable or is vulnerable. It is ironic then that in The Ugly Duckling, the father is mentioned only once. That is when the duck mother is brooding on the ugly duckling egg. She laments about the father of her offspring. That scoundrel hasn't come to visit me once. For a long time in our culture, the, the father, unfortunately, and for whatever reasons, was unable or unwilling to be there for anyone, most sorely, even himself. One could easily say that for many, many wildish girl children, the father was a collapsed man, just a shade, who hung himself along with his coat in the closet every night. What a way to say that. You're such a good writer. You know what though? I don't, I never, I don't know. I don't know. Never. That's a pretty strong word. Yeah, just the ideas of children out of wedlock and, you know, what that, you know, like I was, I was even taught through, you know, my upbringing and how my grandparents have been and I've seen and yeah. And how it means like if you were to have a baby out of wedlock that, you know, what, now you're a big embarrassment? What, now your soul's in danger or something? What a gift, right? All the things that have to transpire into the making of a human. So magic. Okay. Transpire, conspire. Mm -mm -mm -mm. When a woman has a collapsing mother construct within her psyche and or her culture, she is wobbly about her worth. She may feel that choices between fulfilling outer demands and the demands of her soul are life and death issues. She may feel like a tormented outsider who belongs nowhere, which is relatively normal for the exile. But what is not normal is to sit down and cry about it and do nothing. One is supposed to get to one's feet and go off in search of what one belongs to. For the exile, that is always the next step. And for a woman with an internalized collapsing mother, it is the quintessential step. If a woman has a collapsing mother, she must refuse to become one to herself also. The child mother or the unmothered mother. The image port portrayed by the duck mother in the tale, as we can see, is very unsophisticated and naive. By far the most common kind of fragile mother is the unmothered mother. In the story, she, su she who is so insistent on having babies eventually turns from her child. There are many reasons a human and or psychic mother might act thusly. She may be an unmothered woman herself. She may be one of the fragile mothers, psychically very young or very naive. She may be so psychically dislocated 
that she considers herself unlovable, even by a baby. She may have been so tortured by her family and her culture that she cannot imagine herself worthy of touching the hem of the radiant mother archetype that accompanies new motherhood. You see, there are no two ways about it. A mother must be mothered in mothering her own offspring. Though a woman had, though a woman has an inalienable, inalienable spiritual and physical bond with her offspring, in the world of the instinctual wild woman, she does not just suddenly become a fully formed temporal mother all by herself. Mm -hmm. In olden times, the blessings of the wildish nature normally came through the hands and words of the women who nurtured the younger mothers. Especially first-time mothers have within them not an experienced old crone, but a child mother. A child mother can be any age, 18 or 40, it doesn't matter. Every new mother begins as a child mother. A child mother is old enough to have babies and has good instincts in the right decision, but she needs the mothering of an older woman or women who essentially prompt, encourage, and support her in her mothering of her children. For eons, this role was served by the older women of the tribe or village, these human goddess mothers, who were later regulated or relegated by religious institutions to the role of godmother, constituted an essential female-to-female -female nutritional system that nourished the young mothers in particular, teaching them how to nourish the psyches and souls of their young in return. When the goddess mother role became more intellectualized, godmother came to mean someone who made sure the child did not stray from the precepts of the church. Much was lost in the transmigration. The older women were the arcs of instinctual knowledge, uh, knowing, and behavior, who can invest in young mothers with the same. Women give this knowing to each other through words, but also by other means. Complicated messages about what and how to be are sent simply through a look, a touch with the palm of the hand, a murmur, or a special kind of I cherish you hug. The instinctual self always blesses and helps those who come after. It is this way among healthy creatures and among healthy humans. In this way, the child mother is swept across the threshold into the circle of mature mothers who welcome her with jokes, gifts, and stories. This woman-to-woman -woman circle was once the domain of wild women. And it had open membership. Anyone could belong. But all we have left of this today is the little tatter called a baby shower, where all the birthing jokes, mother gifts, and genitalia stories are squeezed into two hours' time, no longer available to the woman throughout her entire lifetime as a mother. <laughs> hmm. I hate baby showers. But not as much as I hate reveal parties, dude. <laughs> I don't know. What is that? Does that make me a bad person? I cherish life, though, and babies. So, seems like a whole lot of fanfare. But what this this is talking about seems like awesome. Like, it's like meeting at the water hole. <laughs> In most parts of industrialized countries today. The young mother broods, births, and attempts to bene benefit her offspring all by herself. It is a tragedy of enormous proportions because many women were born to fragile mothers, child mothers, and unmothered mothers. They made themselves possess a similar internal style of self-mothering. The woman who has a child mother or unmothered mother construct in her psyche or glorified in the culture and maintained at work and in the family is likely to sucker, suffer from naive presentiments, lack of seasoning, and in particular, a weakened instinctual ability to imagine what will happen one hour, one week, one month, one year, five years, ten years from now. 
A woman with a child mother within takes on the aura of a child pretending to be a mother. Women in this stage often have a undifferentiated, long live everything attitude, a do everything, be everything to everyone brand of hyper momism. They are not able to guide and support their children, but like the farmer's children in the ugly duckling story who are so thrilled to have a creature in the house, but do not know how to give it proper care. The child mother winds up leaving the child battered and bedraggled without realizing it. The child mother tortures her offspring with various forms of destructive attention. And in some cases, lack of useful attention. Sometimes the frail mother is herself a swan who has been raised by ducks she has not been able to find her true identity soon enough to benefit her offspring. Then, as her daughter comes upon the great mystery of the wildish nature of the feminine in adolescence, the mother, too, finds herself having sympathy pangs and swan urges. The daughter's search for identity may even inaugurate the mother's maiden journey for her lost self at last. So in that household, between the mother and the daughter, there will be two wildish spirits down in the basement holding hands and hoping to be called upstairs. So these are the things that can go awry when the mother is cut away from her own instinctive nature. But do not sigh too hard or too long, for there is help for all of this. For all of this. All right. <laughs> yeah, man. Surprise! <laughs> oh, Lord. All right. The strong mother, the strong child. The remedy is in gaining mothering for one's young internal mother. This is gained from actual women in the outer world who are older and wiser and preferably who have been tempered like steel. They are fire hardened for having gone through what they have gone through. Regardless of the cost, even now, their eyes see, their ears hear, their tongues speak, and they are kind. Even if you had the most wonderful mother in the world, you may eventually have more than one. As I have often told my own daughters, you were born to one mother, but if you are lucky, you will have more than one. And among them all, you will find most of what you need. Your relationships with todas las madres, the many mothers, will most likely be ongoing ones, for the need of guidance and advisory is never outgrown, nor from the point of view of women's deep creative life, should it ever be. Relationships between women, whether the women share the same bloodlines or are psychic soulmates, whether the relationship is between analyst and analysand, between teacher and apprentice, or between kindred spirits, are kindred relationships of the most important kind. While some who write in psychology today tout the leaving of the entire mother matrix as though it were a coop that, if not accomplished, taints one forever, and though some say that denigration of one's personal mother is good for an individual's mental health, in truth, the construct and concept of the wild mother can never and should never be abandoned, for if it is, a woman abandons her own deep nature and one with all the knowing in it, all the bags of seeds and all the needles for mending, all the medicines for work and rest and love and hope. Rather than disengaging from the mother, we are seeking a wild and wise mother. We are not, cannot be, separate from her. Our relationship to this soulful mother is meant to turn and turn and to change and change, and it is a paradox. This mother is a school we are born into, a school we are students in, a school we are teachers at, all at the same time, and for the rest of our lives. Whether we have children or not, whether we nourish the garden, the sciences, or the thunder world of poetics, we always brush against the wild mother on our way to anywhere else, and this is as it should be. But what shall we say for the woman who truly has had an experience of destructive mothering in her own childhood? Of course, that time cannot be erased, but it can be eased. It cannot be sweetened up, but it can be rebuilt strongly and properly now. 
It is not the rebuilding of the internal mother that is so frightening to so many, but rather the fear that something essential died back then, something that can never be brought back to life, something that received no nourishment, for psychically one's own mother was deaf herself or dead herself. For you, I say, be at peace. You are not dead. You are not lethally injured. As in nature, the soul and the spirit have resources that are astonishing. Like wolves and other creatures, the soul and spirit are able to thrive on very little, and sometimes for a long time on nothing. To me, it is the miracle of miracles that this is so. Once I was transplanting a hedgerow of lilac. One great bush was dead from a mysterious cause, but the rest were shaggy with purple in springtime. The dead one cracked and crumbled like peanut brittle as I dug it out. I found that its root system was attached to all the other living lilacs up and down the fence line. Even more astounding, the dead one was the mother. She had the thickest and oldest roots. All her big babies were doing fine, even though she herself was botas arribas, boots up, so to speak. Lilacs reproduce with what is called a sucker system, so each tree is a root offshoot from the primal parent. In this system, even if the mother fails, the offspring can survive. This is the psychic pattern and promise for those with little or no as well as those who have had torturous mothering. Even though the mother somehow falls over, even though she has nothing to offer, the offspring will develop and grow independently and still thrive. Hmm. Bad company. The ugly duckling goes from pillar to post, trying to find a place to be at rest. While the instinct about exactly where to go may not be fully developed, the instinct to rove until one finds what one needs is well intact. Yet there is a kind of pathology sometimes in the ugly duckling syndrome. One keeps knocking at the wrong doors even after one knows better. It is hard to imagine how a person is supposed to know which doors are the right doors if one has never known a right door to begin with. However, the wrong doors are those that cause you to feel the outcast all over again. Hmm. This is the looking for love in all the wrong places response to exile. When a woman turns to repetitive compulsive behavior, repeating over and over again a behavior that is not fulfilling, that causes decline instead of sustained vitality, in order to salve her exile, she is actually causing more damage because the original wounded state is not being attended to, and she incurs new wounding with each for foray. This is like putting some puny medicine on your nose when you have a gash on your arm. Different women choose different kinds of wrong medicine. Some choose the obviously wrong, such as bad company, overindulgences indulgences that are harmful, or soul stealing things that first build a woman way up and then tear her down to ground zero minus five the solutions to these bad choices are sevenfold if the woman were able to sit herself down and peer into her own heart she would see there is a need to have her talents her gifts and her limitations respectfully acknowledged acknowledged and accepted so to begin healing Stop kidding yourself that a little feel-good of the wrong sort will take care of a broken leg. Tell the truth about your wound. And then you will get a truthful picture of the remedy to apply to it. Don't pack whatever is easiest or most available into the emptiness. Hold out for the right medicine. You will recognize it because it makes your life stronger rather than weaker. Not looking right. Like the ugly duckling, an outsider learns to stay away from situations where one may be able to act right, but still doesn't look right. The duckling, for instance, can swim well, but still doesn't look right. Conversely, a woman may look right, but may not be able to act right. There are many sayings about persons who cannot hide what they are, and in their hearts don't wish to. All the way from the East Texan 
You can dress them up, but you can't take them out to the Spanish. She was a woman with a black feather under her skirt. In the story, the duckling begins to act like a dumbling, the one who can't do anything right. He flaps dust into the butter and falls into the flour barrel, but not until he has first fallen into the milk pitcher. We all have had times like this, can't do anything right, try to make it better, makes it worse instead. Duckling had no business in that house, but you see what happens when one is desperate. One goes to the wrong place for the wrong thing. As one of my dear late colleagues used to say, you can't get milk at the ram's house. It's like, I don't know, I'm, remember, I'm thinking about that, um, that other book I'm reading. That's what you get for giving a fuck when it wasn't your turn to give a fuck. <laughs> Does that even relate? can't get milk at the ram's house. All right. While it is useful to make bridges, even to those groups one does not belong to, and it is important to try to be kind, it is also imperative to not strive too hard, to not believe too deeply that if one acts just right, if one manages to tie down all the itches and twitches of the wildish creatura, that one can actually pass for a nice, restrained, subdued, and demure ladywoman. It is that kind of acting, that kind of ego wish to belong at all costs, that knocks out the wild woman connection to the psyche. Then instead of a vital woman, you have a nice woman who is declawed. Then you have a well-behaved, well-meaning, nervous woman panting to be good. No, it is better, more graceful, and far more soulful to just be what and what and as you are and let the other creatures be what they are too. <laughs> uh, frozen feeling, frozen creativity. Lim uh, women deal with exile in other ways, like the duckling who became frozen in the ice of the pond. They freeze up. Freezing up is the worst thing a person can do. Coldness is the kiss of death to creativity, relationship, life itself. Some women act as though it is an achievement to be cold. It is not. It is an act of defensive anger. In archetypal psychology, to be cold is to be without feeling. There are stories of the frozen child, the child who could not feel, the corpses frozen in the ice, during which time nothing could move, nothing could become, nothing could be born. For a human to be frozen means to purposely be without feeling, especially towards oneself, but also and sometimes even more so towards others. While it is a self-protective mechanism, it is hard on the soul psyche, for the soul does not respond to iciness, but rather warmth. An icy attitude will put out a woman's creative fire. It will inhibit the creative function. This is a serious problem, yet the story gives us an idea. The ice must be broken and the soul taken out of the freeze. When writers, for example, feel dry, 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 they know that the way to become moist is to write. But if they're locked in ice, they won't write. There are painters who are gasping to paint, but they're telling themselves, get out of here. Your work is weird, strange, and ugly. Your work is weirdly strange and ugly. There are many artists who've not yet gotten a good foothold or who are old war horses at developing their creative lives. And yet, and still, every time they reach for the pen, the brush, the ribbons, the script, they hear, you're nothing but trouble. Your work is marginal and completely unacceptable because you yourself are marginal and unacceptable. So what is the solution? Do as the duckling does. Do as the duckling does does. Go ahead. Struggle through it. Pick up the pen already and put it to the page and stop whining. Write. Pick up the brush and be mean to yourself for a change. Paint. Dancers, put on your loose camis. Is that how you say that? Tie the ribbons in your hair, at your waist, on your ankles, and tell the body to take it from there. Dance. Actress, playwright, poet, 
musician, or any other. Generally, just stop talking. Don't say one more word unless you're a singer. Shut yourself in a room with a ceiling or in a clearing under a sky. Do your art. Generally, a thing cannot freeze if it is moving. So move. Keep moving. I really like that. The Passing Stranger. Although in the story, the farmer taking the duck home seems to be a literary device to further the story rather than an archetypal leitmotif about exile, there is a thought here that I think is valuable. The person who might take us out of the ice, who might even psychically free us from our lack of feeling, is not necessarily going to be one whom we belong. It may be, as in the story, another of those magical but fleeting events that again came along when we least expected it, an act of kindness from a passing stranger. This is another example of nourishment of the psyche that occurs when one is at the end of one's rope and cannot stand it anymore. Then a something that is sustaining appears out of nowhere to assist you, and then disappears into the night, leaving you wondering, was that a person or a spirit? That's kind of how I feel about that dude I met. It might be a sudden gust of luck that brings something very needed in through your door. It might be as simple a thing as a respite, a let up in pressure, a small space of rest and repose. This is not a fairy tale we are talking about now, but real life. Whatever it might be, it is a time when the spirit, in one way or another, feeds us, pulls us out, shows us the secret passage, the hiding place, the escape route. And this coming when we are down and feeling stormy dark or darkly calm is what pushes us through the channel to the next step, the next phase in learning the strength of the exile. Exile as boon. If you have, if you have attempted to fit whatever mold and failed to do so, you are probably lucky. You may be an exile of some sort, but you have sheltered your soul. There is an old or an odd phenomenon that occurs when one keeps trying to fit and fails. Even though the outcast is driven away, she is at the same time driven right into the arms of her psychic and true kin. Whether these be a course of study, an art form, or a group of people, it is worse to stay where one does not belong at all than to wander about lost for a while and looking for the psychic and soulful kinship one requires. It is never a mistake to search for what one requires. Never. It's awesome. So one of my new moon manifestations is uh, self-discovery. It's awesome. There is something useful in all this torque and tension. Something in the duckling is being tempered, being made strong by this exile. While this situation is not one we would wish on anyone for any reason, its effect is similar to pure natural carbon under pressure, producing diamonds. It leads eventually to a profound magnitude and clarity of psyche. There is an aspect of alchemy, wherein the base substance of lead is pounded about and beaten down. While exile is not a thing to desire for the fun of it, there is an unexpected gain from it. The gifts of exile are many. It takes out weakness by the pounding. It removes whininess, enables acute insight, heightens intuition, grants the power of keen observation and perspective that the insider can never achieve. Even though there are negative aspects to it, the wild psyche can endure exile. It makes us yearn that much more to free our own true nature and causes us to long for a culture to match. Even this yearning, this longing makes a person go on. It makes a woman go on looking, and if she cannot find a culture that encourages her, then she usually decides to conduct, to construct it herself. And that is good, for if she builds it, Others who have been looking for a long time will mysteriously arrive one day, enthusiastically proclaiming that they have been looking for this all along. 
Yeah. I love you, Genevieve. <laughs> Hugs. The uncombed cats and cross-eyed hens of the world. The uncombed cat and the cross-eyed hen find the duckling aspiration stupid and nonsensical. It gives just the right perspective on the touchiness and the values of others who denigrate those who are not like themselves. Who would expect a cat to like the water? Who would expect a, a hen to go swimming? No one, of course. But too often, from the exile's point of view, when people are not alike, it is the exile who is inferior, and the limitations and or motives of the other are not properly weighed or evaluated. Well, in the spirit of not wanting to make one person less and another person more, or any more than we have to for the purposes of discussion, let us just say that here the duckling has the same experience that thousands of exiled women have, that of a basic incompatibility with dissimilar persons, which is no one's fault, even though most women are too obliging and take it on as though it is their fault personally. When this happens, we see women who are ready to apologize for taking up space. We see women who are afraid to just say, no, thank you, and leave. We see women who listen to someone telling them they are wrongheaded over and over again without understanding that cats don't swim and hens don't dive underwater. <laughs> I must admit, I sometimes find it useful in my practice to declinate, oh, sorry, delineate the various typologies of personality as cats and hens and ducks and swans and so forth. If warranted, I might ask my client to assume for a moment that she is a swan who does not realize it. Assume also for a moment that she has been brought up by or is currently surrounded by ducks. There is nothing wrong with ducks, I assure them, or with swans, but ducks are ducks and swans are so swans. Sometimes, to make the point, I have to move to other animal metaphors. What if you were raised by the mice people? But what if you're, say, a swan? Swans and mice hate each other's food, for the most part. They each think the other smells funny, they are not interested in spending time together, and if they did, one would be constantly harassing the other. But what if you, being a swan, had to pretend you were a mouse? What if you had to pretend to be gray and furry and tiny? What if you had no long uh, snaky tail to carry in the air on tail-carrying day? What if wherever you went, you tried to walk like a mouse, but you waddled instead? What if you tried to talk like a mouse, but instead you came, uh, out came a honk every time? Wouldn't you be the most miserable creature in the world? The answer is an inequivocal yes. So why, if this is all so and too true, do women keep trying to bend and fold themselves into shapes that are not theirs? I must say from years of clinical observation from this problem, that most of the time it is not because of deep-seated masochism or a malignant dedication to self-destruction or anything of that nature. More often, it is because the woman simply doesn't know any better. She is unmothered. There is a saying, tu puedes sabre muchas cosas. You can know about things, but it is not the same as sentido, possessing sense. The duckling seems to know things, but he has no sense. He is unmothered, meaning untaught at the most basic level. Remember, it is the mother who teaches by expanding the innate talents of the offspring. offspring. Animal mothers who teach their offspring to hunt are not exactly teaching them how to hunt, for that is in their bones already, but they are teaching them what to watch out for what to pay attention to. Those things are not known to them until the mother shows them, thereby activating new learning and innate wisdom. It is the same for the woman in exile. If she is an ugly duckling, if she is unmothered, her instincts have not been sharpened. She learns instead by trial and error, usually many trials, many, many errors. But there is hope, 
For you see, the exile never gives up. She keeps going till she finds the guide, the scent, till she finds the trail, till she finds home. Wolves never look more funny than when they have lost the scent and scrabble to find it again. They hop in the air. They run in circles. They plow up the ground with their noses. They scratch the ground, then run ahead, then back, then stand stock still. They look as if they have lost their wits. But what they are really doing is picking up all the clues they can find. They're biting them down out of the air. They're filling up their lungs with the smells at ground level and at the shoulder level. They are tasting the air to see who has passed through it recently. Their ears are rotating like satellite dishes, picking up transmissions from afar. Once they have all these clues in one place, they know what to do next. Ooh. Though a woman may look scattered when she has lost touch with the life she values most and is, a, and is running about trying to recapture it, she is most often gathering information, taking a taste of this, grabbing up a paw of that. At the very most, one might briefly explain to her what it is that she is doing, then let her be. As soon as she processes all the information from the clues she's gathered, she'll be moving in an intentional manner again. Then the desire for membership in the uncombed cat and cross-eyed hen club will diminish to nothing. Remembrance and continuance, no matter what. We all have a longing that we feel for our own kind, our wild kind. The duckling, you will recall, ran away after being tortured without mercy. Next, he had a run-in with a gaggle of geese and was almost killed by hunters. He was chased from the barnyard and from a farmer's house. And finally exhausted, he shivered at the edge of the lake. There is no woman among us who does not know this feeling and yet it is just this longing that leads us to hang on to go on to proceed with hope here is the promise from the wild psyche to all of us even though we have only heard about glimpsed or dreamt the wondrous wild world that we belonged to once even though we have not yet or only momentarily touched it even though we do not identify ourselves as part of it the memory of it is a beacon that guides us towards what we belong to and for the rest of our lives. In The Ugly Duckling, a knowing yearning stirs when he sees the swans lift up into the sky, and from that single event, his remembrance of that vision sustains him. I worked with a woman who was near the last straw and thinking suicide. A spider making its web on her porch caught her eye, precisely what it was in that we beasties act that chopped the ice around her soul so she could go free and grow again, we will never know. But I am convinced, both as psychoanalyst and as cantadora, that many times it is the things of nature that are the most healing, especially the very accessible and the very simple ones. The medicines of nature are powerful and straightforward. A ladybug on the green rind of a watermelon, a robin, with a string of yarn, a weed in perfect flower, a shooting star, even a rainbow in a glass shard in the street can be the right medicine. Continuance is a strange thing. It puts out tremendous energy. It can be fed for a month on five minutes of contemplating quiet water. It is interesting to note that among wolves, no matter how sick, no matter how cornered, no matter how alone, afraid, or weakened, the wolf will continue. She will hope, or she will lope, even with a broken leg. She will go near others seeking the protection of the pack. She will strenuously outwait, outwit, outrun, and outlast whatever is be bedeviling her. She will put all she will put her all into taking breath after breath. She will drag herself if necessary, just like the duckling, from place to place till she finds a good place, a healing place, a place for thriving. The hallmark of the wild nature is that it goes on. It perseveres. This is not something we do. It is something we are, naturally and innately. 
When we cannot thrive, we go on till we can thrive again. Whether it be our creative life that we are cut away from, whether it be a culture or a religion that we are cut out of, whether it be a familiar exiling, a familial exiling, a banishment by a group, or sanctions on our movement, thoughts, and feelings, the inner wildlife countries, and we go on. The wild nature is not native to any particular ethnic group. It is the core nature of women from Benin, B-E-N-I-N, Benin, Cameroon, and New Guinea. Benin? Benin? It is in women from Latvia, Latvia, the Netherlands, and Sierra Leone. It is the center of Guatemalan women, Haitian women, Polynesian women. Name a country, name a race, name a religion, name a tribe, name a city, a village, a lone outpost. The women all have this in common. The wild woman, the wild soul. They all go on feeling for and following the wild. So if women must, they will paint blue sky on jail walls. If the skeins are burnt, they will spin more. If the harvest is destroyed, they will sow more immediately. Women will draw doors where there are none and open them and pass through into new ways and new lives. Because the wild nature persists and prevails, women persist and prevail. The duckling is led to within an inch of his life. He has felt lonely, cold, frozen, harassed, chased, shot at, given up on, unnourished, out their way, out their way, out of bounds, at the edge of life and death and not knowing what will come next. And now comes the most important part of the story. Spring approaches, new life quickens, a new turn, a new try is possible. The most important thing is to hold on, hold out for your creative life, for your solitude, for your time to be and do, for your very life, hold on, for the promise from the wild nature is this, after winter, spring always comes. <clears throat> wow, one and a half hour. It's okay. We're really close to the end. Maybe like 10 pages, not quite. Love for the soul. Hold out. Hold on. Do your work. You will find your own way. At the end of the tale... The swans recognize the duckling as one of their own before he does. That is rather typical of the exiled woman. After all, that hard wandering, they manage to wander over the frontier into a home territory and often don't realize for a time that people's looks have ceased to be disparaging and are more often neutral when they are not admiring and approving. One would think that now that they are on their own psychic ground. They would be deliriously happy, but no, for a time at least, they are terribly distrustful. Do these people really regard me? Am I really safe here? Will I be chased away? Can I really sleep with both eyes closed now? Is it all right to act like a swan? After a time, these suspicions fall away and the next stage of coming back to oneself begins, the acceptance of one's own unique beauty, that is, the wild soul from which we are made. There is probably no better or more reliable measure of whether a woman has spent time in ugly duckling status at some point or at all throughout her life than her inability to digest a sincere compliment. Although it could be a matter of modesty, or could be attributed to shyness, although too many serious wounds are carelessly written off as nothing but shyness, more often a compliment is stuttered around about because it sets up an automatic and unpleasant dialogue in the woman's mind. If you say how lovely she is, or how beautiful her art is, or compliment anything else her soul took part in, inspired, or suffused, something in her mind says she is undeserving and you, the complimenter, are an idiot for thinking such a thing to begin with. 
Rather than understand that the beauty of her soul shines through when she is being herself, the woman changes the subject and effectively snatches nourishment away from the soul self, which thrives on being acknowledged, on being seen. So that is one final work of the exile who finds her own, to not only accept one's own individuality, one's specific identity as a certain kind of person, but also to accept one's beauty, the shape of one's soul, and the fact that living close to that wild creature transforms us and all that it touches. When we accept our own beauty, it is put into perspective, and we are no longer poignantly aware of it anymore, but neither would we forsake it or disclaim it either. Does a wolf know how beautiful she is when she leaps? Does a feline know what beautiful shapes she makes when she, sit, when she sits? Is a bird awed by the sound it hears when it snaps open its wings? Learning from them, we just act in our own true way and do not draw back from or hide our natural beauty. Like the creatures, we just are, and it is right. For women, this searching and finding is based on the mysterious passion that women have for what is wild, what is innately themselves. We have been calling the object of this yearning wild woman, but even when women do not know her by name, even when they do not know where she resides, they strain towards her, they love her with all their hearts, they long for her, and that longing is both motivation and locomotion. It is this yearning that causes us to search for wild woman and find her. It is not as hard as one might first imagine, for wild woman is searching for us too. We are her young. Dang. The Mistaken Zygote. Over the years of my practice, it became clear that this issue of belonging sometimes needs to be hailed from a lighter side. From levity can shake some of the pain out of women. Oh, for levity can shake some of the pain out of women. I began to tell my clients this story I created called The Mistaken Zygote, mainly as a way to help them look at their outsider material with a more empowering metaphor. This is how the story goes. Have you ever wondered how you managed to end up in such an odd family as yours? If you have lived your life as an outsider, as a slightly odd or different person, if you are a loner, one who lives at the edge of the mainstream, you have suffered. Yet there also comes a time to row away from all that, to experience a different vantage point, to emigrate back to the land of one's own kind. Let there be no more suffering, no more attempting to figure where you went wrong. The mystery of why you were born to whomever you were born to is over. Fini, terminado, finished. Rest for a moment at the bow and refresh yourself in the wind coming from your homeland. <clears throat> Pardon me. For years, when women who carry the mythic life of the wild woman archetype have silently cried, why am I so different? Why was I born into such a strain, strange or unresponsive family? Whatever their lives wanted to burst forth, Wherever their lives wanted to burst forth, someone was there to assault the ground so nothing could grow. They felt tortured by all the prescriptions against their natural desires. If they were natural children, they were kept under roofs. If they were scientists, they were told to be mothers. If they wanted to be mothers, they were told they'd be better fit that they, they were told they'd better fit the mold entirely. They'd better fit the mold entirely. If they wanted to invent something, they were told to be practical. If they wanted to create, they were told a woman's domestic work is never done. Sometimes they tried to be good according to whichever standards were most popular and didn't realize till later that they really wanted what they really wanted, how they needed to live. Then, in order to have a life, they experienced the painful amputations of leaving their families, the marriages they had promised under oath would be till death, the jobs that were to be springboards to something more satisfying but better paying. They left dreams scattered all over the road. Often the women were artists who were trying to be sensible by spending 80% of their time doing labor that aborted their creative lives on a daily basis. 
Although the scenarios are endless, one thing remains constant. They were pointed out very early on as different, with a negative connotation. The actual fact that they were passionate, individual, inquiring, and in their right, instinctive minds. So the answer to why me, why this family, why am I so different is, of course, that there is no answers to these questions. Still, the ego needs something to chew on before it will let go. So I propose three answers regardless. The analysis may pick whatever one she likes, but she must pick at least one. Mo uh, most pick the last one, but any are sufficient. Prepare yourself. Here they are. We are born the way we are and into odd families we came through. One, just because. Almost no one will believe this. Two, the self has a plan and our pea brains are too tiny to parse it. Many find this a hopeful idea. Or three, because of the mistaken zygote syndrome. Well, yes, maybe, but what is that? Your family thinks you're an alien. <laughs> you have feathers. They have scales. Your idea of a good time is the forest, the wilds, the inner life, the outer majesty. The idea of a good time is folding towels. Oh, their idea of a good time is folding towels. If this is so for you in your family, then you are a victim of the mistaken zygote syndrome. Your family moves slowly through time. You move like the wind. They are loud. You are soft. Or they are silent and you sing. You know because you just know. They want proof and a 300-page dissertation. Sure enough, it's a mistaken zygote syndrome. You've never heard of that? Well, see, the zygote fairy was flying over your hometown one night and all the little zygotes in her basket were hopping and jumping with excitement. You were indeed destined for parents who had, would have understood you, but the zygote fairy hit turbulence and, oops, you fell out of the basket over the wrong house. You fell head over heels, head over heels, right into the family that was not meant for you. Your real family was three miles farther on. That is why you fell in love with a family that wasn't yours and that lived three miles over. You also wished Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so were your real parents. Chances are they were meant to be. This is why you tap dance down the hallways, even though you come from a family of television spores. This is why your parents are alarmed every time you come home or call. They worry, what will she do next? She embarrassed us last time. God only knows what she will do now. I. They cover their eyes, then they see you coming, and it is not because your light dazzles them. All you want is love. All they want is peace. The members of your family for their own reasons, because of their preferences, innocence, injury, constitution, mental illness, or cultivated ignorance, are not so good at being spontaneous with the unconscious, and, of course, your visit home conjures the trickster archetype, the one who stirs things up. So, before you've even broken bread together, the trickster madly dances by just dances by just dying to drop one of her hairs into the family stew. Even though you don't mean to upset the family, they will be upset no matter what. When you show up, everyone and everything seems to go quite mad. It is a sure sign of wild zygote in the family if the parents are offended all the time and the children feel as though they can never do anything right. The unwild family wants only one thing, but the mistaken zygote is never able to find out what that is, and if she could, it would make her hair stand up in exclamation points. Prepare yourself. I will tell you this big secret. This is what they really want from you. That mysterious, momentous thing. That unwild want consistency. They want you to be exactly the same today as you were yesterday. They wish you not to change with the days, but to remain as at the beginning of streaming time. Ask the family if they want consistency, and they will answer affirmatively. In all things... No, they will say, only in the things that matter. Whatever these things are that count in their value systems, they are too often anathema, anathema to the wild nature of women. Unfortunately, the things that matter to them are not cohesive with 
the things that matter to the wild child. So I got to look that word up. Anathema. It's like a knife or uh, let's see. A N A T H E M A. Anathema. Anathema definition. Anathema. 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 Someone or something, or something or someone that one vehemently dislikes. A formal curse by a pope or council of the church excommunicating a person or denouncing a doctrine. Anathema. Wow. Okay. Someone or something that one vehemently dislikes. Radical hatred was anathema to her. Anathema. Nathema. Nathalim. Okay, YouTubes. Oh, here we go. Anathema. They are too often anathema to the wild nature of women. Consistency in manner is an impossible sentence for wild women, for her strength is in her adaptation to change, her innovation, her dancing, her howling, her growling, her deep instinctual life, her creative fire. She does not show consistency through uniformity, but rather through her creative life, through her consistent perceptions, quick-sightedness, flexibility, and deftness. If it if we were to name only one thing that makes the wild woman what she is, it would be her responsiveness. The word response comes from the Latin to pledge, to promise, and that is her strong suit. Her perceptive and deft responses are a consistent promise and pledge to the creative forces, be it duende, the goblin spirit behind passion or beauty, art, or the dance or life. Her promise to us if we will not thwart it, is that she will cause us to live. She will cause us to live fully alive, responsively, and consistently so. In this way, the mistake, mistaken zygote gives her fealty, not to her family, but to her interior self. This is why she feels torn. You might say her wolf mother has told her, has, has hold of her tail. Her worldly family has hold of her arms. It is not long before she is crying in pain, snarling and biting herself and others. And finally, the deadly quiet. You look in her eyes and you see ojos del cielo, sky eyes. The eyes of a person who is no longer there. Ojos del luna. While socialization for children is an important thing, to kill the interior creatura is to kill the child. The West Africans recognize that to be harsh with a child. Oh, the West Africans recognize that to be harsh with a child is to cause its soul to retreat from its body, sometimes just a few feet away, other times many days walk away. Wow. While the needs of the child's soul must be balanced with her need for safety and physical care and with carefully examined notions about civilized behavior. I always worry for those who are too well behaved. They often have that faint soul look in their eyes. Something is not right. A healthy soul shines through the persona on most days and blazes through on others. Where there is gross injury, the soul flees. Sometimes it drifts or bolts so far away that it takes masterful pro propitiation. Dang it, I flipped that one up a couple times. Propitiation? Let's try that. <laughs> masterful propitiation to coax it back. A long time must pass before such a soul will trust enough to return. 
but it can be accomplished. The retrieval requires several ingredients, naked honesty, stamina, tenderness, sweetness, ventilation of rage, and humor. Combined these, combined, these make a song that calls the soul back home. That's cool. What are soul needs? They lie in two realms, nature and creativity. In these realms lives Naashe e as Asdaza'a, Spider Woman, the great creation spirit of the Dinna. She gifts her people with protection. Her purview, among others, is teaching the love of beauty. The soul's needs are found in the hovel of those three old or young, depending on what day it is, sisters. Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, who make the red thread, meaning the passion of the woman's life. They weave the ages of a woman's life, tying them off as each is completed and the next is begun. They are found in the woods of the huntress spirits. Diana, and Artemis, both of whom are wolf women, wolf women who represent the ability to hunt, track, and recover various aspects of the psyche. I had a really cool um, goddess Diana meditation on the new moon. Yeah. The soul needs are the soul's needs are governed by Koatlike. Koat Koatlike Koatlike Koatlaku the Aztec goddess of female self sufficiency. Hey, let's find out how to say it, right? I want to. Quatlike Q pronunciation. Quatlique, 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 Quatlique. Cool. I just have like two pages left, and then we'll complete this chapter. The soul's needs are governed by Quatlique. Is that what I just said? Koatlike? Koatlike. 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 The Aztec goddess of female self-sufficiency who gives birth squatting and square on her feet. She teaches about the lone woman's life. She is a maker of babies, meaning new potential for life. But she is also a death mother who wears skulls on her skirt. And when she walks, they sound like the rattles on a snake, for they are skull rattles. And because skull rattles sound like, also like rain, though sympathetic, th oh, through sympathetic resonance, they draw down rain for the earth. She is the protectress of all lone women and those so magia, magia. So filled with powerful thoughts and ideas, they must live out at the edge of who knows where in order not to daze the village too much. Coatlique is the especial protectress of the female outsider. What is the basic nutrition for the soul? Well, it differs from creature to creature, but here are some combinations. Consider them psychic macrobiotics. For some women, air, night, sunlight, and trees are necessities. For others, words, paper, and books are the only things that satiate. For others, color, form, shadow, and clay are the absolutes. Some women must leap, bow, and run, for their souls crave dance. Yet others crave only a tree-leaning space, a tree-leaning peace. There is yet another issue to be dealt with. Mistaken zygotes learn to be survivors. It is tough to spend years among those who cannot help you to flourish. Being able to say that one is a survivor is an accomplishment. For many, the power is in the name itself. And yet comes a time 
in the individuation process when the threat or trauma is significantly passed. Then is the time to go to the next stage after survivorship, to healing and thriving. If we stay as survivors only without moving to thriving, we limit ourselves and cut our energy to ourselves and our power in the world to less than half. One can take so much pride in being a survivor that it becomes a hazard to further creative development. Sometimes people are afraid to continue beyond survivor status, status for it is just that, a status, a distinguishing mark, a damn straight bet your buttons, better believe it, accomplishment. Instead of making survivorship the centerpiece of one's life, it is better to use it as one of the many badges, but not the only one. Humans deserve to be dripping in beautiful rem remembrances, medals, and decorations for having lived, truly lived, and triumphed. Once the threat is passed, there is a potential trap in calling ourselves by names taken on during the most terrible time of our lives. <clears throat> it creates a mindset that is potentially limiting. It is not good to base the soul identity solely on the feats and losses and victories of the bad times. When survivorship can make a woman tough as beef jerky, at some point, allying with it exclusively begins to inhibit new development. When a woman insists, I'm a survivor, over and over again, once the time for its usefulness is past, the work ahead is clear. We must loosen the person's clutch on the survivor archetype. Otherwise, nothing else can grow. I liken it to a tough little plant that managed, without water, sunlight, nutrients, to send out a brave and ornery little leaf anyway, in spite of it all. But thriving means now that the bad times are behind to put ourselves into occasions of the lush, the nurturative, oh, nutritive, the light, and there to flourish, to thrive with bushy, shaggy, heavy blossoms of leaves and leaves. It is better to name ourselves names that challenge us to grow as free creatures. That is thriving. That is what is meant for us. Ritual is one of the ways in which humans put their lives in perspective, whether it be Purim, Advent, or drawing down the moon. Ritual calls together the shades and specters in people's lives, sorts them out, puts them to rest. There is a particular image from El Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, celebrations that can be applied to help women in the transition from surviving to thriving. It is based on the rite of ofrendas, ofrendas, which are the altars to those who have passed from this life. Ofrendas are tributes, memorials, and expressions of deepest regard for the loved ones no longer on this earth. I find it helps many women to make an ofrenda and uh, ofrenda to the child they once were, rather like a testament to the heroic child. That's cool. Some women choose objects, writings, clothing, toys, mementos from events, and other symbols from childhood that will be portrayed. They arrange the ofrenda in their own way, tell the story that goes with it or not, and then leave it up for as long as they wish. It is the evidence of their past hardship, valor, or triumph over adversity. This way of looking at the past accomplishes several things. It gives perspective a compassionate rendering of times past by laying out what one experienced, what one has made of it, what is admirable. It is the admiring of it rather than the being of it that releases the person. To be the child survivor beyond its time is too over-identified with an injured archetype. To be the, I gotta start again. To be the child survivor beyond its time is too over-identified with an injured archetype. To realize the injury and yet memorialize it allows thriving to come forth. Thriving is what was meant for us on earth. Thriving, not just surviving, is our birthright as women. Do not cringe and make yourself small if you are called the black sheep, the maverick, the lone wolf. Those with slow seeing say a 
nonconformist is a blight on society. But it's been proven over the centuries that being different means standing at the edge, means one is practically guaranteed to make an original contribution, a useful and stunning contribution to her culture. When seeing guidance, don't ever listen to the tiny hearted. Be kind to them, heap them with blessings, cajole them, but do not follow their advice. If you have ever been called defiant, incorrigible, forward, cunning, insurgent, unruly, rebellious, you're on the right track. Wild woman is close by. If you have never been called these things, there is yet time. Practice your wild woman. Andale! And again. The end! Woo! Yeah! Dang. That was a lot, right? One, five, five, three, eight, oh, three, nine. Oh my gosh, I'm about to see all the fives. It's happening. There was a four, four. So yeah, 10, 26, awesome. Five, 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 five. It's almost here. Boom, five, 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 five. Woo, awesome. Hey, that way, awesome. Oh, I love you all. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me. I'm glad I got uh, another chapter read from this book. Yeah, that was a lot. I can't, I can't, I gotta digest that. So yeah, until next time, I'm, I probably come back with uh, um, the subtle art book next, but um, this one still keeps it coming. It's going to be a while, I think, before. Well, the thing is, is I really love it. I want to finish it. So I'm going to make that happen. But there's also lots of other books. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. And um, until next time, mwah, I see you very soon. And um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate you. End.